Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug with another chemistry video. And this time we're taking a look at the entire realm of science with a video about the scientific method. If you're new here, don't forget to check out my channel. This is the place for all things first year chemistry and for AP chemistry as well. So if you like what you see, smash that like button and think about subscribing if you would. Well, in this video, like I said, we're focusing on the scientific method. Now there's a good chance that you've learned about the scientific method in some other class. Uh, basically, the scientific method is a method of solving problems. And it's, it is actually quite flexible based upon our purpose. Uh, it can look a little bit different based upon what exactly it is we're trying to do. Uh, research scientists are going to go about this a little bit differently than someone who's trying to solve a much simpler problem. But let's take a look at the scientific method as it applies to most people in their everyday lives. Let's say that you wake up one morning and you're sick. You don't feel well. And so you go to the doctor. Now, the doctor is going to employ the scientific method in order to uh, decide what type of sickness you have and what to do. For example, the doctor does not just look at you after you walk in the door and point to you and say, you have strep throat. It doesn't work that way. The doctor first has to make some observations. And so you've probably experienced this. Maybe the doctor will take your temperature. Maybe the doctor will take your pulse or take the stethoscope and listen to see what's going on in the lungs, maybe your heart rate. This is very important. The very first step is to make observations. Once you've made some observations, then it's time to create a hypothesis. Now, essentially, a hypothesis is what we sometimes call an educated guess that attempts to explain the observation. Now, this is human nature. Anytime we see something, our first inclination is to try to explain it, what's going on. And that's what the doctor does as well. Perhaps the doctor sees that you have a fever and the doctor may say, well, you know, I think it might be strep throat. And so it's an educated guess. Well, what does the doctor do then? Well, very often they'll carry out an experiment. Now, an experiment is just a systematic way of testing the hypothesis. And we do this by gathering data. In the doctor's office, that experiment might be in the form of an actual test. They may take a little swab and do a culture there and, and see what's going on. They might do a test for strep, they might do a test for flu, they might do a test for some other illness to see if the doctor's hypothesis is right or not. And maybe they do these tests and it comes back and up, oh, sure enough, it's strep, strep throat. And so at this point, we can formulate a theory. Now a theory is basically a hypothesis that has significant empirical evidence backing it up. By the way, when we say empirical evidence, we're talking about measurable evidence that we can actually look at and, and test. And so this evidence might show that, you know, the person has strep. And so that's the theory in this case, a hypothesis that has a lot of evidence. Now, the last step in the scientific method is a very important one. Don't leave this out. Take action. So if we're looking at a research scientist, this taking action might involve writing a paper and having it published in a scientific journal so that other scientists can read about the experiment and see what to do. Maybe uh, they can replicate this experiment as well uh, by means of a peer reviewed journal. Maybe they go to a conference and give a talk to other scientists to see what, what the scientist has, has possibly discovered. If you're talking about the doctor, taking action might be something as simple as the doctor prescribing you a medicine to take. And then you take that medicine and hopefully you feel better. Once again, the scientific method is a systematic way by which we solve problems. And if you're not a scientist, there's a good chance that you carry out the scientific method as well. Uh, an auto mechanic will carry out the scientific method. They observe that after they observe something, they think they know what might be happening. They might run a test, maybe some sort of a diagnostic, and they can take action based upon what the test shows. And so the scientific method is just a very systematic way of trying to solve problems. If you've ever solved the problem before, there's a good chance that you've used the scientific method in order to do that. Now, there is a different concept here that is not part of those five steps that we talked about. A natural law. And the natural law is a statement of fact 
that applies to a variety of scientific situations. That part got cut off there. So when we look at a natural law, you might be able to think about some natural laws that you've heard of. Maybe uh, Newton's laws of motion. Those are often laws that we think of. I have a question for you though. Is it possible for a theory to become a natural law? Maybe if a theory has been uh, tested for a long, long time, and maybe if a people start to think it's a fact, a, a, a complete fact, does that mean that the theory can become a natural law? What do you think? Well, you might be surprised that the answer is no. It's actually not possible for a theory to become a natural law. Now, why is that? Well, there are several reasons. The first reason is that theories and laws have completely different purposes. Theories try to explain how or why something happens, whereas laws just state what happens. So for example, uh, you've heard of the Big Bang Theory. Well, this theory tries to uh, explain how the universe began. Why is it that the universe seems to be expanding? Well, the Big Bang Theory attempts to explain why and how. This is the case. Laws, for example, uh, don't say how or why, it's just what. For example, you've heard of Newton's third law of motion. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That's it, right? It doesn't try to explain why or how that's the case. It just states what happens. Now, here's another difference as well. Theories cannot be completely proved. And that's because theories attempt to explain something that can be applied to a very wide variety of situations. For example, there might be a very good theory, and then all of a sudden there's a situation that this theory can't really explain very well. So maybe that theory has to be tweaked, or has to be adjusted, or possibly even replaced completely. On the other hand, laws actually can be proved. In fact, very often in the chemistry lab, we actually do prove some of these laws, like the law of conservation of mass that you might have heard of, or some of the gas laws, like Boyle's law. Now, theories, like we kind of alluded to earlier, sometimes are replaced by a better theory. Sometimes they're tweaked or improved. Laws, on the other hand, really aren't that way. In fact, they're pretty much fact, they're set in stone. In fact, very often laws are represented by mathematical equations. And as we work our way through this chemistry course, you'll start to see several laws that actually do have mathematical equations that go along with them. Well, I hope you really enjoyed this video and learned something from it. If you did, please smash that like button. I hope to see you in the next video where we can learn some more chemistry together.